Thank you. Thank you. My name is Jerry Orstrom. Given Frederick Bastiat's empirically proven statement, where goods cross borders, armies won't, I'd like to ask the friendly Mr. Pillsbury if he truly believes that a wealthy China poses a greater threat to America and to the world and to the region than an impoverished China. Others, I think Mr. Hirsch Mearsheimer clearly an answered that question. I'd like to get your direct answer. Thank you very much. So the gentleman at the back. Hi. I guess this is for Mr. Mearsheimer. He was saying that the, the uh, military strength is the key to controlling China, but it seems that we can't really do anything in Iraq to control Iraq. How are we ever going to control China? And really, economically, since they have trillions of dollars pouring into their country and we're running a major, major deficit, how would we ever possibly finance a military that could overcome China? I mean, they have so much more money in the bank now, and it seems like in the foreseeable future that's going to be the case. So shouldn't we focus on being economic partners with them and trading partners, as Ambassador Roy said, and seek common ground rather than sort of pursue this military concept, which isn't working anywhere for us. Thank you. And the gentleman uh, here in the bow tie, please. Uh, my question also is to Mr. Mersheimer. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, sorry to pile on you, but um, why do you believe, contrary to uh, every example in recorded history, that the United States can continue uh, to be the most powerful nation in the world? And in what way are the citizens of those countries, which used to be the most powerful nations in the world, Sweden, the Netherlands, Great Britain, uh, any worse off now that they are no longer citizens of the most powerful nation in the world? Thank you for that very understanding question. Uh, <laughs> let's, um, let, let's start first, uh, though, with a question uh, for Michael Pillsbury about uh, a wealthy China surely being better for America and the world than an impoverished one. Uh, I prefer a wealthy China to a poor, angry China. Uh, I think the the issue, I, though, I is think not Mike wealth. Has just joined our side. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's an even time. trade. <laughs> State Department's always seeking new allies. <laughs> <laughs> I think the issue is really democracy, and a wealthy, democratic China is a better partner for us, a better ally a better friend than a poor, than even a poor democratic China. The problem is how to get from here to there without being foolishly naive in building up China's economic strength uh, in, a, in a way that they also maintain their nationalism, they maintain their anti-American views, and they, that, it ends, that the situation ends up that we have been gullible and naive over a 15 or 20 year period. And this has happened before. If you read John Mearsheimer's most recent book, it really chronicles the number of times this has happened in world politics. So if you really want to support our side of the resolution, you need to be thinking about this phrase the moderator used, which I love. I think he's working for us, too. Don't worry, be happy. Because that's what their side really is advocating. What I am saying be wary in the following four or five ways. We need to continue our military exchange program with the Chinese military and let them see that we're not their enemy. We don't want to call that off because we don't worry, be happy. We need to continue the embargo on arms sales to China. We shouldn't sell weapons to China. We should continue the year, our support that the European Union has its embargo on arms sales to China until human rights improves significantly. We should continue to do something about Taiwan's defense. We don't have to arm them to the teeth, but we shouldn't just walk away from Taiwan. And finally, we need to have technology limits on our most advanced technology that we transfer to China. Right now, it's very generous, but there are a few things we hold back, and some people say that was part of their successful test against a satellite in space, is that they had some Western technology uh, at, their, at their service. And frankly, I don't know if all of you know, as perhaps as civilians, 90% of your military forces go through satellites, communications, intelligence. Also, every time you use an ATM card, that's a satellite conveyed transaction. So we're a highly vulnerable society with our 400 satellites in space. 
This test is very serious in January, and the Chinese government, after repeated requests, has no explanation for it. They just say, oh, don't worry about it. Don't worry, be happy. Okay, Thank you very to... much. <laughs> John Mearsheimer, could you take on both of those questions, essentially the question of whether or not American hegemony should or can afford to continue forever? Yeah. You, you want to let Daniel... No, no, go ahead. John Mearsheimer, and then we'll turn to Daniel Rose in a moment. Very quickly on all three questions. The first one said where goods cross borders, armies don't. I think that's empirically wrong, and there was a tremendous amount of economic interdependence in Europe before World War I, uh, and World War I still happened. And if you look at German-Soviet relations in 1941, there was actually a tremendous amount of economic intercourse, and yet you still had uh, World War II. And in the Cold War, in fact, you had hardly any economic intercourse between the United States and the Soviet Union, and nevertheless, you never had a shooting war. Now, on the question of whether or not we could possibly contain China, uh, which gets into the two other questions that I was asked, uh, and the person pointed out, how could we possibly contain China when we can't even deal with Iraq? Uh, I would note that going to war in Iraq was a completely crazy idea from the beginning. And whether or not you can fight and win in Iraq is a very different issue than whether you can contain China down the road. And the analogy I would point to that makes this quite obvious is our experience in Vietnam and at the same time our experience containing and defeating the Soviet Union during the Cold War. The Vietnam War, like the Iraq War, was a completely cockamamie idea. Uh, but nevertheless, the United States, even though it lost in Vietnam, still won the Cold War. Uh, and there's no question that the United States should avoid, should avoid fighting Iraqs down the road. But it clearly has the wherewithal uh, to uh, finance the defenses to, to contain China down the road. And this gets to the final question, which is, can the United States remain number one forever? And if we don't, we'll be, will we be that badly off? Uh, first of all, nothing's forever. So the United States is not going to remain number one forever. But I would be willing to bet a lot of money that the United States is actually more powerful relative to the rest of the world over the course of this century, largely for demographic reasons, uh, than it is right now. A lot of the doomsayers who say that the United States is in real trouble down the road are simply wrong, in my opinion. And I think a powerful case can be made, contrary to what we're talking about up here, that China won't rise uh, anywhere near as much as many people think it will. Then getting to the final point, are we worse off, or would we be worse off not being so powerful? Look at the Europeans. Well, if you look at Europe in recent times, that's true. But let's go back to 1900 and think about being a pole anywhere from 1900 to 2007. Think about growing up in France any time between 1900 and 2007. Yeah, the last few decades have been pretty good. Uh, but if you look at the broader sweep of history, it looks mighty nasty. And who's to tell what the future looks like? Many of you assume that it's going to be peace, love, and dope forever, right? I mean, Europe has been pacified. War has been burned out of Europe. Maybe, maybe not. I'm just a very prudent person. I don't like to take chances. And that means that I just prefer to be much more powerful rather than <laughs> as powerful as the other states in the system. Right. Thank you very much, John Mearsheimer. A very quick response from Daniel Rosen. This is going to start to sound like a George Bernard Shaw play, but I'm with Pillsbury. Uh, a, a wealthy, democratic China is clearly in the U.S. interest. Be wary of arguments that you can foster democracy in China by stymieing the boom. A boom doesn't guarantee democratization. A bust guarantees that you will not get there. That can be said pretty clearly. And we already see early evidence of democratization processes starting to take place. People elect their own co-op boards. They decide who represents them in their parent-teacher associations in their schools. This is happening already, and everybody who spends time in China sees it manifestly. Thank you very much.